soft tissue tumors. Well, thank you, Nicole. It's a great pleasure and honor to uh, be here with you. I've been here two weeks and it's been a wonderful uh, university, and I've really enjoyed the time that I've, I've had with students. Now, I didn't get into medical school the first time, so I went to the Naval Academy. I thought I was going to go to medical school afterwards, but I was not accepted. So I had to go to a guided missile destroyer for three years. And I went to the guided missile destroyer, and I had 100 people work for me in the engineering uh, division. And how do you get those 100 people to do what you want them to do? Well, the only way you can get them to do it is by teaching them. And I learned right away that if you want people to do things, then you have to teach them how to do it. And when I went to medical school, I really enjoyed anatomy. And my first summer, I was a teaching assistant in anatomy to teach the, my fellow students about anatomy. So today I'm going to talk to you about imaging and decision making of soft tissue tumors. And I think it has a tremendous amount to do with anatomy. Now, each year in the United States, there are about 9,000 uh, soft tissue sarcomas and about 3,000 uh, bone sarcomas. So soft tissue sarcomas are much more common than bone sarcomas. The big problem with soft tissue tumors is that it's difficult to distinguish benign from malignant when you see the picture. The benign vision is far out number malignant ones by a ratio of 100 to 1. So many people do not know um, what the warning signs of a sarcoma are, or how to take care of the problem. Now, soft tissue tumors that we deal with uh, in orthopedic surgery and general surgery are from non-epithelial extraskeletal tissue, muscle, fat, blood vessels, nerves, and fibrous tissue. And the pathologists classify the tumors along the direction of differentiation of the cells. Now, the pathologists love to have the tumor specimen right in front of them so they can study it. But we as the clinicians have to decide, should we take something out? Should we biopsy it first? Should we give radiation first? Should we give chemotherapy first? And it's, it's more of a conundrum for us. And even though this classification system works well for the pathologist, it doesn't really work that well for us who see patients. Now, sarcomas. Better? Sarcomas are in the upper and lower extremities in about 60% of the cases, and all age distributions are accounted for. And it's more common in males than females. I like this particular topic because all orthopedic surgeons deal with masses on the extremities. All general surgeons, all primary care physicians, every single student and physician in this room has four extremities. So everybody needs to know about soft tissue masses. Now the presentation of soft tissue sarcomas is insidious and non-specific. Patients can present with a painless mass, a painful mass, and maybe a history of trauma. And for the students, what does it mean insidious and non-specific? Well, I'm taking care of a gentleman right now whose brother is a very prominent physician at Johns Hopkins uh, University. Brother had surgery uh, in one of our southern states, and it really wasn't very good surgery at all. The, the gentleman had a soft tissue sarcoma. But when he presented to his doctors, he didn't say, I have a high grade sarcoma of my elbow that I think I should get preoperative chemotherapy and preoperative radiation for. That's not how people present. People present in insidious and non specific fashion. My elbow hurts me, I've got this mass. Uh, what do you think? So that's what insidious and non-specific means. Now, on physical examination, benign features of soft tissue masses include soft, small, less than five centimeters, and superficial. The exceptions are the desmoid tumor and hemangiomas. The desmoid tumor can be very hard, and hemangiomas can be very large. Malignant features are large, greater than five centimeters, deep, and firm. Now, the exceptions are synovial sarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, sarcoma, epithelial sarcoma, and clear cell sarcoma, which can present as small soft tissue masses. Now, for the students, you've seen all these cross-sections. 
that we have, have shown you in the anatomy laboratory and in the lectures and in the MRI scans. Well, soft tissue sarcomas grow in a centripetal pattern. They start out as a little pea, and they become a walnut, and they become a baseball, and they become a small softball. So they grow in this centripetal fashion. Now, it's really interesting. One of the fathers of orthopedic surgery did a study in 1982. And he looked at when people manage soft tissue sarcomas and bone sarcomas, there was a 20% incidence of major errors in diagnosis, 10% incidence of non-representative tissue, and 18% incidence of complications from biopsy, altered treatment, 18%, unnecessary amputation, so you have to cut off somebody's arm or leg, 5%, and adverse outcome, almost 10%. Now, if you had these numbers for breast cancer, it would be a revolution. People would say these numbers are not acceptable at all. So this was in 1982. In 1982 is when I finished medical school, and Dr. Mankin, who's a very colorful individual, went around the country stomping his feet and banging the podium, saying we're doing very, very poorly. Well, he did all that, and interestingly, Dr. Mankin, again, in 1996, repeated the study. 600 cases, multi-institutional, and lo and behold, he found the exact same numbers, exact same numbers, no change at all, no change at all. So what he found was that certain diagnosis seemed to be associated with the higher frequency of errors, and most of these were the soft tissue sarcomas, like MFH, synovial sarcoma, lyomyo sarcoma. So soft tissue sarcomas had a much higher incidence of people making States. And MFH, synovial sarcoma, fibrosarcoma, all the soft tissue sarcomas had a higher incidence of problems. Now, areas that we see or were seen in that study include delay in diagnosis and inappropriate excisional biopsy. This is a patient who was managed at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, uh, just so that I'm not throwing stones at everyone. So, this is a man, 35 years old, he was a correctional officer. And he got beat up in the jail by uh, several inmates and had pain in his shoulder. And one of my partners saw this patient. We got this MRI, which showed this mass. And our radiologist read the mass as showing hematoma. So my partner followed this patient for nine months. The mass continued to grow and it was a soft tissue sarcoma. Well, lo and behold, when you go back and look at the MRI, there wasn't a single feature of that MRI consistent with hematoma. Absolutely not. So it was a bad radiology reading, bad management, and the patient went nine months with the soft tissue sarcoma, and the case went through litigation. So not a happy story. This is a woman who I saw uh, a couple years ago, had a mass in the back of her leg, and the <clears throat> orthopedic uh, surgeon saw the mass, she was pregnant at the time, and decided not to get an MRI, told her to come back after she delivered the baby. Well, she came back after the delivery of the baby. This mass was really, really large, big problem, and this is a synovial sarcoma. And we really could not save her leg, so I did an above knee amputation uh, for her. So another delay in diagnosis. One of the biggest problems that we see is inappropriate excisional biopsy. So unplanned removal or the shell out procedure. So this is a young man, 44 years old. I say young because I'm 59 now. Um, so this is a young man that had this mass in his elbow, and the surgeon saw him and just went ahead and took it out. And then within a month, you can see the fresh incision, the tumor's growing back. So this was a soft tissue sarcoma. And when I treated this, I had to do a very large resection. I had to resect the lateral collateral ligaments, the annular ligament, do a big soft tissue reconstruction. Because we, gave, we were going to give him radiation, I had to put plates on his bone. So a lot more than I would have done if he had not had the unplanned excision. This is a, a woman who is 78 years old, had a mass in her forearm, and the radiologist read this as a hematoma. Well, the orthopedic surgeon, who actually did his fellowship at the Johns Hopkins University, took it out and was very proud of himself and took these pictures, but all the margins, positive, and this is a problem, and this woman opted for amputation. So really an unnecessary amputation. You know, if she had been treated correctly the first time, she wouldn't have had her arm taken off. 
So unplanned excision is a really big problem. And the problem with it is that once somebody goes in there, takes out the mass, the local recurrence rate, even when you plan for good surgery afterwards, is very high, up to 25%. In England, they call this the oops procedure because whoops, we made a mistake. We went in there, we took it out, we shouldn't have taken it out, we should have done a biopsy first. So in England, it happens about 40% of the time, and they call it the whoops procedure. Well, the problem is that current staging systems do not aid the clinician in decision making. Should we choose for a particular patient observation, incisional little needle biopsy, or excisional biopsy? Now, we spent a lot of time with the students talking about T1, are really good for the anatomy, and T2, which shows pathology. So if you have this mass in the buttock, this is in the gluteus medius muscle, what should you do? Should you take it out? Should you observe it? Or should you do a needle biopsy? Well, all the staging systems that we have really don't help you at all, because you have to know the diagnosis before you use the staging system. So the challenge for us as clinicians, I think, is to analyze the imaging studies, the radiographs and the MRI, and choose the next correct step, observation, incisional or needle biopsy, or excisional biopsy. So for the students, the radiograph is the first step. And we can tell with the radiograph whether this is a bone tumor with soft tissue extension, a surface bone tumor, or a soft tissue lesion. Like this patient who just came to me with a mass in the buttock, just by taking the radiograph, I could tell that this was something arising from the bone. Now, we often look at the radiographs and we say, is the lesion radiolucent or radiodense? Is there any cortical bone erosion or destruction? Is there matrix mineralization in the lesion? Radiolucent lesions are usually fat. So whenever we see fat in the deep tissues, we pretty much know we have the diagnosis of lipoma. When it's radiodense, it's more of a problem thinking maybe this could be a sarcoma. Interestingly, synovial sarcomas have about 15 to 20 percent incidence of having a lot of mineralization in them. So you take the radiograph, you see this mineralization in the soft tissues, and you're thinking perhaps this could be a synovial sarcoma. If we see flavolates, like you see in this radiograph at the end of the arrow, you pretty much know the patient has a hemangioma. This is tumoral calcinosis, pretty easy radiographic diagnosis. Heterotopic ossification is usually mineralized at the periphery and lucent in the center. So we see bone at the periphery and immature tissue in the center. Now for all the students, we really like MRI because it gives us superior soft tissue definition. And as I'm going to show you, you're able to characterize some of the tissues. So we like MRI because it gives us really nice pictures. We can show the anatomy very well, especially on the T1-weighted images. So we can see where the blood vessels are, where the nerves are. We can see the mass. Now there's lots of different types of MRI and lots of different acquisition methods. We always use fat suppression. And the pulse sequences is really infinite combinations, infants, so that you really, as a clinician, sometimes have trouble figuring it out. We use a contrast agent sometimes when we want to improve the quality of MR angiography or to determine lesion vascularity. Fat suppression is really important. This is where we turn the fat completely black. When we turn the fat completely black, we can often see lesions. Now, for the students, T1 is what we call the longitudinal or spin relaxation time. T2 is a spin-spin relaxation time. So T1 is a measure of the longitudinal relaxation of the protons, while T2 signal decays as a function of time. Now, I don't know any of that because I'm an orthopedic surgeon, and I really know how to use, um, use a knife and a hammer, and I'm not really into the physics. So really, all you need to know is TR and TE. In short TR and TE accentuate T1 differences, and long TR and long TE accentuate T2 differences. Now these signal qualities, you can look at margination, whether it's homogeneous or whether it's invasive. So you look at this mass in the soft tissues. And this is a soap bubble right here, so you can see where the mass is. So this mass in the soft tissue is very well demarcated. And 
somebody might say it has a lot of benign characteristics, but it's a high-grade malignancy. Now, all tumors have the same signal characteristics. They're low on T1 and they're high on T2. Now, not everything that's low on T1 and high on T2 is a soft tissue sarcoma, but all soft tissue sarcomas are low on T1 and high on T2. And most of them have this centripetal pattern of growth. So they have a centripetal pattern of growth They often have nodules. Now, for the students, when we look at T1 weighted images, we know that the ligaments, tendons, fibrous tissue are low signal. They don't have many mobile protons in them, so they're very low signal. Muscle is moderate signal, and tumors are low signal. So if we look at this, we know that this is the tibia, this is the fibula, here are the anterior muscles, and here's the tumor that we see very well on the T1. The T2 is a lot more fuzzy, but the T2 rated images show the high signal of the tumor mass. So here's a tumor low on T1, and it is high on T2. Some radiologists feel that if the signal is very homogeneous, well marginated, that it's probably benign. The criteria are relative, and MRI does not permit absolute distinction between benign and malignant masses. So this mass looks very well demarcated, small, round, but it's a high-grade sarcoma, which has the capability of killing the patient. So the classification system that we developed at Hopkins um, helped us in terms of decision-making on what to do for these tumors. So when you study the MRI, you have to ask yourself, is it a benign neoplasm? Is it a reactive process? Is it a process which cannot be identified? Now, my pitch to the students is that you don't work in isolation. You work with the radiologist, you work with the pathologist. So every single patient I see, I bring my images, I bring the patient's images to the radiologist and say, what do you think? One of the people that trained Dr. Uh, Ying Wei is Dr. Cameron, a uh, very famous surgeon at Hopkins, probably the best surgeon in the world. Always goes down to Dr. Fishman, shows him the CT uh, images. So determinative masses are ones that you study the MRI with the radiologist and you say, we know exactly what this is. It's a lipoma, it's a ganglion, it's a hemangioma, it's heterotopous ossification, it's a muscle tear, it's determinant. We can look at it, we know absolutely what it is. When you have a determinant mass, you can plan treatment without doing a biopsy. So you can look at this mass, and it exactly matches the subcutaneous fat, and this is a lipoma. Here's another lipoma in the neck, and when we do fat suppression, it completely turns black. So the mass is determinant. Without doing a biopsy, by studying the MRI, we know what it is. Sometimes we think it's a lipoma, but when we do the T2-weighted images, we see it does not completely fat suppress, so it's not routine lipoma. When I was a resident, in angiomas, we couldn't make the diagnosis without doing a biopsy. Now, with the MRI scan, it's a determinate mass. We don't have to do a biopsy. We know exactly that this is a hemangioma. Heterotopic ossification, same thing. We can see the muscle fibers inside the mass, call the texture sign, and make the diagnosis. Cysts of, uh, around the knee joint, again, we can make the diagnosis. Same thing with cysts around the hip. When we add the contrast, we see it in a peripheral fashion. So we call that rim enhancement. It is a cyst. There's nothing inside the, the tumor. It's all water, so it's a cyst. Now, when the mass is indeterminate, when you can't tell what it is, you must do a biopsy to establish a histologic diagnosis before you plan treatment. So what, I, what we try to teach our residents, our students, our colleagues, is that if you don't know what something is, you can't take it out. You cannot plan treatment. It sounds so simple, but you can't plan treatment without knowing what it is first. So if you can study the MRI and you're 100% sure what it is, you can plan treatment without doing a biopsy. If you don't 
know what it is, you have to do a biopsy first. So here's a patient that had a mass in his foot. They didn't know what it was, but they went ahead and removed it. It's a high-grade sarcoma. So now it's a much bigger problem. There is no radiologist in the world who will tell you what this mass is. It is low on T1, it is high on T2. The only way to know what it is is to do a biopsy first. So the mass is indeterminate in nature. Same thing with this. No radiologist in the world will take it out. So you must will tell you what it is. So you have to do a biopsy before you plan treatment. Same thing with this. Here's a mass in the hand. I went over this with the students the other day. Low on T1, high on T2. You have to do a biopsy first. If you just take it out, you're going to get into big trouble. So the decision making is that if you're going to choose observation, so you see the patient, you lay your hands on them, you absolutely know what the mass is. If it's benign, not growing, you can choose observation. If you lay your hands on the patient, it's a mass, you get the MRI, you still cannot figure out what it is, it is indeterminate, and you must do a biopsy first. If you don't do a biopsy first, you're going to get into big trouble. Now, excisional biopsy is the big mistake. That's when people do not know what it is, they take it out, all the margins are positive, and the family is really upset. Nowadays, if you take out a mass, that is malignant, and then you have to refer the patient. By the time the patient gets to the referring doctor, he or she looks it up on the internet, and they say, hmm, maybe this mass shouldn't have been taken out like this. Maybe I should have had a biopsy first. So we do not take something out. If we do not know what it is. We have to do a biopsy first. So in summary, I'd just like to tell the students that you're always better off working in teams. Clinician, radiologist, pathologist, the signal sequences are complex. There's no orthopedic surgeon, and I think I'm pretty experienced. I can't figure them, figure them out sometimes. You have to work with the radiologist, and I like to say that three heads are better than one. So with soft tissue masses, first determine if you can tell what it is. If you can't tell what it is, you cannot plan treatment without doing a biopsy. So know what it is, you can plan treatment without the biopsy. If you don't know what it is, it sounds simple, but you've got to do the biopsy first. An excisional biopsy should only be performed if the multidisciplinary team is positive that the lesion is benign. Multidisciplinary approach will minimize delays in diagnosis, treatment errors, and complications. And when we look at these lousy, lousy numbers, generated by orthopedic surgeons, general surgeons, and plastic surgeons. You say, if we taught them decision making, maybe these bad numbers uh, would not be so apparent. And you should not perform excisional biopsy unless you're 100% positive that the lesion is benign. Now, the students were asking me about balance. And I have been a doctor now since 1982, so I'm coming up on my 30th year, um, this January, and balance means that your family comes first. So simple as that. Balance means your family comes first. So there's no reason that um, my, my wife's a physician, she's a radiation oncologist, there's no reason that you can't have a family. Absolutely not. There's no reason you can't go to every single thing that's important, but you have to be organized. There's also no reason you can't have fun. My wife and I live on the water. We have a home uh, on the Magathy uh, River. I love to go there every single day. I'm going there tomorrow. I'm going tonight. Uh, we love our uh, place uh, on the water. I like to fish. I could fish every single day if they would send me a check. Uh, I, love, I love to uh, fish. And I like to go out with my son or with anybody that I can go out with. Uh, I was try I tried to be in terms of balance at all my children's uh, events because I think it really makes a difference. I took my children fishing all the time. This is my wife uh, Debbie, who's a radiation oncologist at Hopkins, and my daughter uh, Anne Marie. This is my father-in-law uh, Vincent, who passed away several years ago. 
Um, this is my pier, so I go out and look at my pier all the time at my uh, boats. And this is the view from uh, our pier. And this is the deck on our home. Uh, we love, Debbie and I love to uh, cook. This is my daughter, uh, Carolyn, my son Frankie now, and he's a little grown up. And we love to, to fish. This is my farm. So uh, my grandfather came from Italy, and he had $17 in his pocket. He came in the early 1900s, and uh, he was a farmer. He told me never to be a farmer. He says that as a farmer, he says, you'll never starve, but you'll never make any money. And they took away his land one day, so I always wanted a farm. So two years ago, Debbie and I bought a farm. I have a nice trout stream on there, big pastures, and... I really like to get out there and work in the dirt. This is a uh, asparagus trench, Charlie, that I uh, put in uh, at my house in uh, Pasadena. So uh, I like to plant things quite a bit. And this is my mom, who passed away uh, seven years ago. Um, I think about her all the time. This is my new boat, which I just bought uh, several months ago, that I named after uh, my mother. Uh, I uh, love to fish. And this is my dog, uh, Zena, who I'm sure will be patiently waiting for me as soon as I get home. Now, this is for Charlie. The crucial elements of the problem in soft tissue masses is that different disciplines evaluate patients with soft tissue masses. We have different education programs between different disciplines. We have different education programs within a discipline. We have tremendous variability in MRI reports. We have no accepted classification system before we buy our system. And I can even hazard to say we probably lack the expertise to train ourselves to be safer and more systematic. So even in 2011, one of Charlie's partners back at uh, Johns Hopkins University, a very high profile individual in the medicine department, his brother had surgery for a soft tissue sarcoma, which wasn't very good at all. As a matter of fact, it was terrible uh, in 2011. So it's a big problem uh, when patients present with soft tissue masses. And I think the classification system that we've developed, I think, works uh, pretty well. So I very much enjoy uh, my time uh, here. I appreciate everybody coming to the lecture. I hope I get to interact with the uh, students again. Thank you very much. Any questions at all? Yep. Patrick? Talk about who, uh, who does the biopsies. Is it um, how much is great interventional radiology doing? How much is the, the surgeon? So when I first came to Hopkins 20 years ago, we had no biopsy service. So I did all the biopsies myself. We had no cell phone service, no biopsy service, nothing. In, um, in the last seven or eight years, we've developed a biopsy service. So now all the biopsies are done by Dr. John Carino's group, who was recently here. So that all the biopsies are done by interventional radiology. We also set up a really good database, and we published our first paper with 500 patients on it that we uh, looked at the accuracy of our uh, biopsy uh, results. So right, right now, they're all done by the interventional radiologist. We have a conference uh, once a week where we present all of the patients that we saw and decide do they need to be biopsy, do they not need to be biopsy. So it really works out so much better when you have lots of people looking at cases and deciding what to do. Other questions? Yeah. This is the last study by Has anyone that study? No, nobody's redone the study. Uh, I think it has to be redone at some point. I'm not sure the numbers are going to be much better. Uh, and the, the problem is that we don't know how to train ourselves. We have plastic surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, general surgeons, get all these people out there, all these different education systems, and it's, it's a real problem. Like in this country, we have the National Heart Institute. All the big problems down to the National Heart Institute. If you had the National Institute for Soft Tissue Masses and all the soft tissue masses in Malaysia, 
came here, or at least all the MRIs came here, so that they could be looked at, presented, and decide what to do, then it would work. The problem is that, and I frankly tell my residents and my students, a patient comes to see a doctor in Sterling, Virginia, which is 200 miles from me. And the patient says to the doctor, just take it out. I don't want to go all the way to see Frassic or in Baltimore. I don't want to travel that distance. Just take it out. When you take it out, then it's a big problem. But the problem is we just don't have the classification systems and the imaging reports are not that sophisticated. Any other? Yeah. I need to ask what might be a dumb question. I'm not a surgeon. When you say, you know, if you just take it out, outcome is terrible. Is it the damage from the surgery? Is it the positive margins that are left behind? Is it the burns, metastasis? So it's two different types of surgery that you do. If you know the tumor is benign, you take it out and you save all the structures around it. If the tumor is malignant, you have to get a cuff of normal tissue completely around it. So the surgery is completely different. The second problem with it is, not only is the surgery different, but you tend, if you cut into the tumor, you spread it around everywhere. You put it into the lymphatic system, you put it into soft tissues where it wasn't before, you put it up near the skin, you put it in places that it was not before. And when patients say, well, they cut into the tumor and my mom died six months later, then perhaps they're right because it didn't need to be cutting into that tumor. Yeah. What about retroperitoneal sarcomas? Retroperitoneal sarcomas are, are difficult to treat, and my wife, who's a radiation oncologist, loves to see them get a biopsy first. And many of the general surgeons take it out first. Even at my institution at Johns Hopkins, they take it out first. They just whack it out and then deal with it afterwards, and it's usually a problem. And People who are more learned, we have general surgeons who are part of our group, they don't do that. But there are quite a few general surgeons, unfortunately, at our hospital who will just whack it up. And it becomes a problem. Whether you're a head and neck surgeon, whether you're a general surgeon, you really should know what it is before you go and you take it up. For the students, it's really education to the patient is so important. So when you tell the patient this could be a sarcoma, when you image them correctly, when you look for metastases, when you do staging, they will be much more willing to accept the plan than if you do all that stuff afterwards. And then if you cut into it, and then there's metastases, well, the metastases were there before, but you're going to have a hard time convincing the patient that they were there before. They're going to say, they're there now because you cut into it. So it really helps if you know what you're doing before, before you do it. Nobody would ever let somebody replace their carburetor without knowing that the carburetor was bad first. If you just brought your car in and said, well, it runs poorly, and the technician said, I'm going to replace the carburetor, I take the carburetor out and put a new one in, you say, aren't you going to look at it first? Aren't you going to determine what's wrong before you take it out? Any other questions? Thank you so much.